let's get right into it. Uh, let me be happy to introduce uh, Jack Schlesinger, uh, game designer, programmer, writer, works include Not Words, Spell Tower, Good Sudoku, Cards of Darkness, We Should Talk, among many others, and a, uh, a teacher at NYU, also working on a tabletop RPG with a procedural dungeon master called If You Die in the Game, You Die in Real Life, The Game, which I just, I like that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, thanks uh, for introducing me, Alexi. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to give this talk. Um, all right, I'll jump into it. So, um, yeah, the you know who am I? I uh, I've worked on a bunch of games, and most recently, Good Sudoku and Not Words, uh, which are two different types of puzzles. And one of the things that my collaborator Zach Gage and I, while we were working on these puzzle games realized was that we were using a lot of the procedural generation techniques that uh, you'd use in a roguelike. And the way that we were thinking about doing this puzzle generation was really similar to the way that we would think about generating a roguelike. And so that was the genesis of this talk. Um, and the roguelike celebration seemed like a appropriate time to uh, introduce this talk to the world. So. Just, uh, I, I think most people are familiar with Sudoku, but really quickly, it is a puzzle game where you have different uh, rows and columns of numbers, and you have to order the digits one through nine into each of the empty spaces so that each row and column only has each digit once, and each house or little box only has each number once. Um, it's far more likely that you'll be less familiar with uh, a newer game that Zach and I released back in April called Not Words, which is a uh, very simple spelling game where you have different zones that have letters that can be in each zone. For example, if you look in the upper uh, left-hand corner of this first puzzle, A, I, and W have to go into those three cells in some way. Um, and when you finish, everything vertically and horizontally uh, needs to be a, uh, a, a an Eng valid English word. Um, so that is the puzzles that I'm primarily going to be talking about. And uh, yeah, so let's just jump right in on it. So uh, I know that this is probably the wrong crowd to uh, ask why you'd want to procedurally generate something. But I do get asked pretty frequently, like, why would you procedurally generate puzzles? Like, a, you know, a cross for puzzles Sudoku. Isn't it much better to do them by hand? Isn't there this, like, craft of doing them by hand? And in, in reality, computers are, are really a lot better at some tasks than humans are, right? Knowing whether or not that there's a solution to a puzzle uh, as a human being, uh, frequently you have to uh, solve the puzzle in order to do that. And a lot of puzzles are just much easier for a computer to solve than a, a human being. Uh, is there only one solution to a puzzle or are there multiple solutions? You know, being able to go through a lot of permutations really easily. Um, Computers are also much faster at some tasks than human. You know, if I'd made different choices, how much would that change the experience of going through this puzzle um, is something that we'll talk about a bit more towards the end. Um, and also that you're going to be lucky if you have players who are much better at your game than you are, right? Like the, the ideal situation is one where your game is successful enough and people like your game enough that they are much better at it than you are. So you're going to only be limiting your possible audience if you, you know, say that you're going to be the author and pen all of the puzzles that are going to be in your game. Um, and the space is just too wide. Um, so, for example, in Sudoku, there are t not, uh, nine to the 81 possible arrangements of nine digits in 81 cells, right? Um, so that comes out to a really big number. Uh, it turns out that 10 to the 82 is like the upper bound estimate on how many uh, atoms there are in the universe. So uh, we're getting close to like, you know, 
10 or so atoms, if you divided the number of atoms in the universe by 10, there would be that many possible arrangements of numbers in a Sudoku grid. But not all of those are valid Sudokus, right? So, um, you know, we actually have, you know, a much smaller number, you know, 6.67 times 10 to the 21 valid filled grids. And then you can actually permute each of those, right? You know, if you replace, swap the one and two in a valid filled grid, it's essentially the same grid. You can also rotate the grid clockwise or counterclockwise. You can uh, swap the rows and columns in specific ways. You can uh, horizontally, symmetrically, or both mirror the grid. So we actually have a much more uh, compact number of unique field grids. Unfortunately, we then have to start taking numbers out of them. And uh, if we get down to non-essentially equivalent minimal puzzles, um, we're back up to even more than valid field grids that we had. So um, it's just way too big of a space to explore with pen and paper. I saw somewhere that like, if you were to have every human on the planet, if you were gonna have 7.3 billion people, which gives you an idea of how out of date these numbers are. We had 7.3 billion people start doing Sudokus. We wouldn't finish them until like midway through the 3000s. Uh, so uh, we're uh, definitely not going to get to it. This image is really great. It comes from a website called Sudoku Dragon. I found it when um, we were doing Good Sudoku originally um, because Good Sudoku started with Zach and I not really having a deep appreciation of Sudokus, more asking why we didn't have a deep appreciation of Sudokus. Um, and this is a great graphical representation of, um, you know, despite looking at uh, what is a really humongous space when we're talking about how many puzzles there are. If you look at this image, the red being puzzles and the blue orange part being not puzzles, there's way more space that is actually not valid puzzles, right? So just uh, trying to do it by hand, trying to do it at random, we're not really gonna get uh, to where we wanna be, right? Now, Computers are worse at some tasks than humans, right? Sometimes much worse. Like, is this next step easy or difficult to see? Is this task hard or easy for a human to do? That that can be really tough and tricky. And computers do exactly what you tell them to do, even if you make a mistake, right? So, and there's just too many uh, procedurally generated puzzles even to go through by hand, right? So we have to come up with ways of calling down the the all of the generated puzzles, figure out what we're going to use and when we're going to use them. So while Zach and I were in this position, we started thinking about this. These were the problems that we needed to solve, right? We needed to make the actual puzzles. We had to figure out if the puzzles themselves were solvable, right? Not just we made something that we think is a puzzle. We have to know that they're solvable before we send them out to people and have them try to make them or play them. Um, for good Sudoku, that's one and only one solution to a puzzle. Um, and then for not words, it's that all the words are valid English words and that it has a unique solution, unique using common words because English, there are a lot of really bizarre words and it's oftentimes more fun for people to be able to use odd or unfamiliar words in order to solve the puzzles. Um, so we allow alternate solutions. Um, and how do you know how difficult a pu procedurally generated puzzle is, right? How do you know whether or not this is uh, a, a good or a bad puzzle, which I, I kind of shortened to like interesting. How do you know, even if you know how, what skills you would need to solve a puzzle, that's not the same as knowing whether or not the puzzle is interesting. And I think we took a lot of cues from uh, roguelike generation. And then also I think there's some things that we discovered that might be really useful when you're designing your next rogue like procedural generator. So how do you generate a dungeon, right? Um, this is when we were like, how do you generate a puzzle? We asked ourselves, how do you generate a dungeon, right? We think of the techniques that you need in order to uh, solve the puzzle as monsters and the order that you solve the puzzle, uh, particularly for puzzles that have one solution or uh, no guessing is the path 
through the dungeon, through the dungeon itself. Um, so we took a cue from uh, dungeon generation. I'm going to do a really quick explanation of BSP tree dungeon generation, which stands for um, binary space. Um, the P is uh, going to be explained on a later slide because I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, propagation, partition. Uh, thank you, Alexi uh, just messaged it to me. Uh, so very, very quickly, essentially you have some sort of a space that you wanna fill uh, with rooms. You uh, just pick a random spot and you pick vertical or horizontal and you divide it into two. You repeat that multiple times over and over again until you've uh, created rooms that are the correct size. You lay your rooms on top of it and you've made a very simple dungeon, right? Um, so how did we apply this to making uh, Sudokus? Well, the kind of the first step for us in making Sudokus was how do we even get something that is a Sudoku that we can then make better? Right. So what we did is uh, we just made a filled Sudoku, which is kind of arbitrarily easy to make uh, something that is uh, an, correctly a Sudoku. And then we would start taking out uh, numbers mirrored uh, horizontally and vertically over the center. So at every step, we would just remove some remove two of the digits out of it, double check using our solver that it was still a valid Sudoku, which the solver I'll come back to in a bit. And then uh, that was essentially how we did it. And then we used a, a similar, we, the binary space partitioning tree was our jumping off point for the initial not words generation. Um, which was, we'll just fill up the space. We'll make that initial big black box by just uh, arbitrarily randomly filling up a space by just picking words that will fit into the space that we have until we run out of space. And then kind of step backwards uh, th through each of the decisions we made while we were filling it in and see if we can make it better. So in this example, if we took one step back, because we still have two gaps in here, and we tried a different word instead of yak, we can find, oh, well, we can now add tum. Whereas there aren't any common English, you know, common non-abbreviation words that are T space K or A space A that would work with R as the starting letter right there, right? And so we just repeat this binary space, uh, algorithm or this kind of uh, binary space partitioning adjacent algorithm multiple times going back a couple times over and over again every step along the way um, yes I see someone posted tick slash talk those are I, I would call abbreviations it would be T I C K T I T O C K I uh, probably should have picked a better example but we step backwards through each of those different steps um, until we end up with something that is well filled, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that we've created a good puzzle from the perspective of difficulty or it being interesting. It just means that we've filled in the space as best we can, right? Um, yes, I agree, uh, Boris the Brave. This is BSP was the jumping off point for this, but uh, because of the, it, it isn't very much like BSP anymore. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so uh, that was basically the creating a space of this is going to be the cat cry uh, yuck is, or sorry, yak is going to be the space that we're trying to explore and then going back through it. So the second question we had to answer was what makes a dungeon solvable, right? So no inaccessible rooms and no unintentional dead ends, which the more we thought about it, for inaccessible rooms and not words, that's uh, really clear, right? If we have a not word where it's not fully attached, we've actually made like multiple puzzles that are just adjacent to each other, right? So the solution that we essentially use is a flood fill. 
Oh, I had to re-export my slides as PDFs, so you're not getting a sweet gif of flood fill right now. But I'm sure that you're all relatively familiar with it. And then for uh, uh, kind of the other interpretation of inaccessible rooms was whether or not the puzzle is actually capable of being solved, right? This is an uh, example of a Sudoku that actually cannot be solved because it has uh, two uh, deadly patterns in it, which make it ambiguous whether it is uh, has one, it does not have one solution, it has more than one solution. So if you see all three, four of these red cells can be uh, five or six and nothing else, that means that you could put five into each of them or six into each of them. Um, and so our solution for that was to make a solver, right? If we, if we ran into any ambiguities along the way with the solver, we uh, knew that we would have to go backwards. So we'll talk a little bit more about making a solver when I, I get to it in a second, but this had the side effect of us being able to like add a hint system that was pretty verbose. But as far as making a solver, we just identified the techniques for Sudoku, fortunately. There's a big community of people who have developed a lot of techniques. Um, and then identify what makes deadly patterns. And if we ever ended up with a deadly pattern, it was very easy to identify it. So as far as creating a solver, uh, Zach and my technique is uh, not necessarily very rigorous. Um, but uh, we play the game a lot, examine the steps we're taking, and then you try to create like axiomatic rules to describe the steps that you've taken, right? So in the example of not words, it's like, oh, if I see these two letters or these three letters, I have an intuition that they're most likely going to be in this order, right? I before E, for example, stuff like that. Um, you know, if I see E, Y, I know that that's almost always going to be uh, E and then Y and not a Y and then E in most situations. And so that, you know, became a nameless technique that we put into an outward solver. What other sets, and then take a step backwards, right? Like, okay, so this is the step that I'm taking over, over and over again. I am seeing the set of letters and I am intuitively doing that. Now, what other sets of letters would match that rule? Now I'm going to start using frequency analysis on the English language, right? I can, I, we have a word, bunch of word lists of common words. We have a dictionary. We have various ways of scoring whether or not a word is uh, common or not. And so I can start doing analytics on that set of words that we have, right? Oh, okay, what other pairs of letters are above a certain, pro are like 90% of the time, they're always in this order. 95% of the time are always in this order. Um, and then can, right, can I do any kind of statistical analysis in order to confirm my suspicions? And so um, th this is a big one as well, is, you know, having people play it, ask people what they're thinking, watch the decisions that they make and kind of go back through it, be like, oh, okay, they started in this corner. That's interesting. I wonder why they did that. Um, see if you can break some rules out of that and then just iterate a lot. Um, and so uh, the other way to think about dead, that we thought about dead ends uh, and solvability is like, can you get a dungeon in an unsolvable state? Like, can you lock a door over here so that you can't get through this other thing over here to get to the exit? Which in not words was really, you know, if you sol have a valid solution for a part of a puzzle, it can have a cascading effect if you've gotten incorrect solution, right? So it's possible that you've got a fully correct solution over here on the left side, and it creates a fully incorrect, it makes the rest of this, the puzzle completely insolvable. And so um, our solution for this was to start creating reinforce every time we notice something like this, like, oh, okay, we can get certain shapes where these two parts are only connected in one place, and if you use these letters in the wrong place, you're not going to be able to use them over here. We created rules like for each zone, which is the collection of cells that have letters together. 
Um, we're going to make it so that if you have that in an order we didn't predict, you can at most have like two words be valid um, more than one zone away, right? So we started taking steps back to think like, what are the dead ends that you're going to run into? You know, what are the pain points that are going to feel really bad? Um, difficulty, right? This is a big one, which is potentially much easier when you're thinking about um, a dungeon, which is like the number of obstacles or monsters or traps that are at a certain level compared to the player. But we don't necessarily have that when we're thinking about puzzles. So we uh, basically identify the different steps we need to solve the puzzle. Here are some of the uh, techniques that you would use for Sudoku and assign each of them a score and then count the number of each technique and a path through the puzzle, right? For Sudoku, uh, because, you should, you, because you never have to guess in a Sudoku because it should have an unambiguous answer. Um, it's easy for us to make these counts for different levels of the solver, right? We have like a beginner difficulty solver that only knows some very easy things. So it's going to take a very it's going to take a very roundabout path through it. And then we can set the solver to be an expert level. It might notice a technique that allows it to shortcut some stuff. Um, and uh, but in both cases, we can not just identify how difficult this puzzle is, how difficult is this puzzle for an expert player, for a beginner player. Um, now, this is a little trickier when we uh, talked about uh, not words, because we didn't start out with the techniques um, like we did with Sudoku. And so we had to use a slightly different solution. Um, which is, you know, thinking about those things that are make it easier or harder. When we look at the E's, you know, there's only, it doesn't matter what orientation these E's go in, like they can't, you can't put these two in incorrectly. Um, you know, there are letters that we have that only have one possible ordering, um, you know, so that uh, definitely makes this puzzle less interesting, right, or, or less good. And so then we can look at this other version of, you know, when we were doing that little search through the space of this puzzle, um, we ended up with these two puzzles. This one, there's multiple valid you, uh, vowel positions. You can have cot, you can have tan, you can have uh, pan, um, and you have multiple valid consonant positions. So this is going to generate a more interesting play, right? So one of the techniques that uh, kind of inspired the way that we think about how we work through the space once we've landed on a very compressed grid was the cellular automata way of developing dungeons. So Conway's Game of Life, really quickly, you know, you have a grid, any cell that uh, has fewer than two or more living, uh, Fewer than two or more than three living neighbors dies. Any cell with exactly three living neighbors becomes alive, that born, and then in any other case remains as it was, survive. So um, this is the way that you would abbreviate that to BS, uh, sorry, B3, S23. You uh, say all the digits that create either one of these situations. So, um, uh, unfortunately, you don't get to see this great Jeremy Cunn uh, gif where it shows this random grid that becomes a cavern. I definitely recommend going to that blog. It's really great. Um, but this is one of the ways in which you can develop realistic like uh, caves, and it kind of passes your gut check, right? If uh, you have a wall and more walls get near it, so that makes sense that it would be fine. You wouldn't want to get rid of that. But if you have an isolated wall, you know, like a single cell or just two cells, you want to remove those because that would be kind of like a weird pillar in the middle of a cave. Um, so instead of too compressed or too empty and developing not words, we have one possible solution, repeated letters, right? So here's an example of we've identified that we want to keep uh, we like the top left corner of this. We don't like the bottom right corner of this. 
so we can remove that and start stepping through various English words that we like better, right? So we can throw the L's in there, which also have a problem. So then we can throw in dry and we can throw in sly. And we end up over here with this puzzle uh, that is much uh, cleaner, a little bit more interesting. It has uh, words that are less common. It has a more bigger variety of vowels, um, which gets us into what makes a puzzle interesting. Right. So this is going to be a separation of the incidents. Right. When you're in a dungeon, it, ideally, your dungeon is not just one big room with all of the monsters in it. Um, or it can be. It uh, just depends on what kind of game you're making, I guess. Um, a flow of tension release and then good storytelling. Um, I come to games by way of, of theater and actually being a theater writer. And so um, I've always been super drawn to the idea of single player games feeling like one of the typical dramatic arts, right? It should feel like you start off with something, it, you know, it's not fully wholly inaccessible. And then the more that you get into it, the, the tougher it gets until you finally unlock the answer to this, this game. And it's kind of a denouement. You have like a short release as you uh, get to the inevitable conclusion, right? And so um, in, oh, you don't get to see uh, this GIF either. Uh, for uh, puzzles, we think of this interesting story kind of like an interesting path, right? An interesting path should, it, for a game that involves no guessing, like Sudoku, would be how frequently, given different seeds for the solver, are the same techniques in a row, right? Like. How often do you just have like hidden single, hidden single, hidden single, hidden single? Um, is there one technique that dominates the puzzle? Is it all mostly one technique or is there a good variety? How many different techniques are there? Um, if you have multiple visible techniques, how different are the paths if you choose one or the other? Um, and then, you know, a game that does have uh, guessing, like not words, you would want to run the solver with multiple different seeds. And then we look at consistent spots like, ah, this part is always pretty easy for the solver to figure out. The um, This part is weirdly always very challenging for the solver to figure out. Um, and then look for inconsistent spots, right? Oh, these are, depending on the way that you're approaching it, where you're coming from, these parts are really inconsistent. They're either really hard or they're arbitrarily easy. And um, just throwing some math on here, you can then use a, a population variance in order to assess how, um, how variable the difficulty is going to be on a puzzle. Because we don't just want, we want a lot of difficulty in the puzzle, but we don't want the puzzle to either be arbitrarily hard or arbitrarily easily, depending on which order you go through it. So um, as I, uh, this is a math with no numbers, oh no. Um, the top is just a uh, population variance, the X being each value for difficulty, U being the mean, and then N being the number of them. Um, but this calculation is just what I like to use it can obviously be however you want to assess uh, how swingy each part is as far as how much variance you have. And so uh, I'm going to wrap up now just by saying a couple takeaways, which is uh, if you treat your dungeon like a puzzle, uh, the way that we make puzzles, making a solver or a simple player model can probably teach you a lot, right? Can you can help you assess difficulty, can help you assess consistency, and maybe some kind of very variable of interestingness. And then if you treat your puzzle like a dungeon, uh, we started realizing that creation is really just refinement and solving the puzzle is telling a story because it's definitely much clearer the storytelling when you are you know, embodied as a character. And just generally, I'd always recommend adapting other domains techniques into your own. Not words, uh, I didn't get into it because I only had 30 minutes, but not words also uses some AI techniques from fighting games to predict what words will make the most sense or what future words might be possible to fit into other places using Markov chains. So um, I 
was, I know, I apologize. Um, I am going to be in the breakout room. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to talk to some of y'all and definitely reach out if you have more questions. Yeah, thank you. Just right in time. I was going to show up with the Shepherd's Crook and you you wrapped it up <laughs> exactly on time uh, with, with the bombshell that like, oh, well, now you. I want to know about the fighting game as well. Um, but thank you. That was that was fantastic. Yeah, I found it really interesting. I, I listened to the eggplant episode recently oh. <laughs> uh, that I really enjoyed. And I was like, oh, boy, now I'm even more excited for yeah. uh, Rogue Lake Celebration. Uh, too bad your, your gifts had trouble. If, if you tweet them or something, then we can try and retweet them and get them in front of yeah. people. 